Okay, let's resume our first lecture with the next sub lecture part where we start to discuss geology as a science and what it means to be a science, the way in which science gathers information about the world and interprets it is different than other ways of gathering and interpreting information. And so we wanna talk about that just a little bit. And then over the course of the ne next couple lectures, we'll look at a, a, at a couple of examples of how geology has worked as a science. I wanna begin by posing a thought question to you. In the way that we use these words colloquially in everyday life, what is a hypothesis? And what's a theory? And what's a fact? Pause for a moment and think about what these are and how you would describe them uh, and how you would describe their colloquial use and what you think their scientific use is and whether they're different or not. This would be another good one for you to post on the discussion board if you'd like. But the most important thing is that you pause here for a moment and think about it yourself for a little bit before you move forward. In science, when we talk about hypotheses, we're talking about statements that are testable in some way, that we could investigate somehow. Uh, and, and if it were possible that this statement were false, that we would observe that with whatever testing method we're choosing. So one fairly broad hypothesis would be something very basic before we get into any more geology, something like gravity, causes landslides. You could come up with a few different ways of testing this. Uh, maybe you might think, okay, well, if gravity causes landslides, then an, another planet that experiences gravity differently might not have landslides or, or have them um, to a lesser degree if its gravity is, is lower on the surface of that planet. Um, perhaps you could set up other ways in which you tested to see whether other causes were the main cause of landslides. Things like this are, are, are behind why a hypothesis would be testable. You can investigate them in some way. Another piece that science in general uses uh, is that we use empirical evidence. This means measurable and thus quantifiable. You can put a number on it that you can compare with other numbers. It's observable. We can observe it either with our own senses or with instrumentation. We can measure it, so we can measure it and quantify it. And you can do, in some cases, experiments with it, where you set up ways in which to change some variable and see how it changes the evidence that comes out. Science isn't just pure theory or logic, which isn't empirical evidence. These are not the same thing. And certainly logic and reasoning is an important part of science, but a really major part of science is that you gather evidence somehow. You gather observations that you can measure and quantify. So let's talk about those terms that I had had you uh, think about briefly. So a hypothesis can explain observations and it is testable as we said, but it's also tentative. It hasn't been completely verified probably. You may have done a few tests on it or somebody may have done a few tests on it but it still wouldn't rise to the level that you have a whole lot of confidence that it's true. To be tentative is just to be that it's your best explanation right now, but accepting that there is a strong chance that it could change with future knowledge. Hypotheses also tend to be a little smaller in scope than something like a scientific theory. So if somebody says colloquially, I have a theory, probably what they should be saying is, I have a hypothesis. But that would make them sound like even more of a nerd. So they're probably just going to say, I have a theory. When we talk about this in science, a scientific theory 
is bigger than a hypothesis for one. It's a coherent set of hypotheses. It's, it's got a lot more going on. It can explain a lot of information like the theory of gravity. Gravity explains a whole heck of a lot of things that go on on Earth's surface, on Earth's interaction with planets, yada, yada, yada. It's been well tested. It's not just a hunch, but we've done lots of investigations that could have falsified the elements of this theory, that could have said this theory is wrong. And it stood up to scrutiny. It stood up to those tests. Moreover, one reason that a theory is unique is that it has a mechanism. It explains, or at least tries to explain, why. In contrast, a law is maybe of a similar scope to a theory. It can explain a whole lot of things that go on, and it has withstood all observations, right? It's well tested, very well tested if you're going to call something a law. But it doesn't explain why. I'll add here that it's often. Uh, mathy, or it has some mathematical description. Like the law of gravity has a, an algebraic equation that you could write out to describe it and how gravity should work quantitatively, but it doesn't tell you why gravity happens. I'll make clear here, why is for the theory. So if we're saying why something happens, and we're saying that gravity happens because of particular subatomic interactions that allow matter to attract one thing to another. We're giving it a why. That's the theory. The law would just be that it's that gravity is proportional to the mass and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Right? You could write that as a mathematical law, but it doesn't tell you why gravity happens. One important thing is that science, even these theories and even these laws are always open to revision. They're never completely set in stone. It would take a lot of observations at this point to overturn the theory of gravity, but it could be done. If you ended up taking enough observations and enough things seem to be in conflict with that law of or the theory of gravity, depending on how you're testing it, then you could say that theory, the theory of gravity is wrong. It could happen unlikely, given all our current observations and how many of them back up that theory. But the thing is that science is always open to these sorts of revisions, partially because it is based on that empirical evidence. And we never observe everything that has ever happened. So there's always room for this revision. Now, when we talk about scientific facts or things that are facts, there's usually small scale observations. They're little things that we see, and they're sort of the, the bits of data that build up to and support or refute hypotheses. And then in some that support or refute things like theories and laws. Now, one thing that you should be cautious of is if somebody says scientific proof. Proof implies some sort of certainty. And as we said, science is always, always, always open to revision with new information. So if somebody claims to have proof of something, scientific proof of it, you should be skeptical. We haven't even proven that gravity can happen because we can't, because of the nature of empirical observations. Now, if this just sort of, or, or if you if you hear this sort of philosophical discussion and you're interested, I'll make sure to post a, a video or two that links you to a more thorough discussion of what it means to be scientific. Uh, and similarly, if you hear all this and you're like, oh, this is a bunch of mumbo jumbo, I don't believe you know, that you know, science works this way, or I'm, uh, you're, if you're unsatisfied with my description, similarly, you should check for those videos. But this is just a really quick introduction to how science in general works. And the next couple of things we'll talk about, one in this lecture and one in a soon to be future lecture, we'll talk about a couple of different ways in which geology has gathered information to learn about things that we can't observe directly. And thus how geology has fun uh, functioned as a science. <laughs>